Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to the channel and to today's video where we will be unpacking the connection between ion infusions and a low serum phosphate. This one is quickly becoming an exam question favourite, but it's far from intuitive. So today we are going to unpack this and it's going to make so much sense. Okay, so in order to understand how on earth an ion infusion could cause someone to have a low serum phosphate, we first need to acknowledge how the body handles phosphate. Stay with me. So phosphate comes into the body in our diet. We absorb around 65% of this. And if we want to get rid of phosphate, we will do this through our kidneys by allowing more phosphate to get lost in the urine. And there are three hormones which help you to regulate your phosphate. Now, can you tell me which hormones control your phosphate? Pause this video and write them down. First of all, which hormone helps us to absorb more phosphate in the gut? The answer is activated vitamin D. Activated vitamin D goes to the gut and helps us to absorb both calcium and phosphate. Now, what about hormones that help us to lose phosphate via the kidneys? These hormones help us to reduce the amount of phosphate transporters in the proximal tubule, meaning that we can take less phosphate back into the body and so more passes into the urine. And there are two hormones that can do this. Now, what are those hormones? And the answer is FGF23 and PTH. Now, FGF23 was put on planet Earth to regulate your phosphate. FGF23 is the main hormone that helps you to get rid of phosphate. PTH, on the other hand, can cause us to lose more phosphate in the urine, but it was put on planet Earth mainly for helping us to regulate our calcium. The phosphate stuff, it's just a kind of an added bonus for PTH. But FGF23, it's all about the phosphate. So, spoiler alert, <laughs> this ion infusion causing a low phosphate situation has something to do with FGF23. Let's check that out now. So, FGF23 is made inside bone cells and in response to a high serum phosphate and various other stimuli that go along with a high serum phosphate, FGF23 can leave the bone cells head to the kidneys, bind to the FGF23 receptor, which works together with a co-receptor called Clotho, and this will promote phosphate loss in the urine. But the FGF23 that does this is the full length intact FGF23. But that's not the only FGF23 kicking around your body. We also have a cleaved version of this hormone, which doesn't go to the kidney. It has nothing to do with the phosphate, and we're not entirely sure what it does, <laughs> but we think it's important for local activities within bone cells and bone marrow. So when FGF23 is made, the intact FGF23 is generated, but this can be cleaved into C FGF23. And this stays around the cell and doesn't upset the phosphate at all. And this is where the iron infusion situation starts to make sense. When someone is iron deficient, they ramp up FGF23 production, but they also ramp up cleavage of FGF23. So they have lots of the little cleaved version and phosphate remains completely normal. But when us doctor humans come along and prescribe an iron infusion, this whole setup can change because some iron infusions inhibit the cleavage of FGF23. Whoa, 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 whoa. So now we have a previously iron deficient human who was ramping up that FGF23 production but cleaving it to use locally. And then all of a sudden, we have stopped the cleaving of this with our iron infusion. And so now we have lots and lots of intact FGF23 kicking around, going to the kidney and telling the kidney to dump that phosphate into the urine. So that's the connection between iron infusions and a low phosphate. But not all iron infusions are equal. 
This phenomenon has been associated predominantly with ferric carboxymaltose, where low phosphate has been reported in around 50% of people. But the other iron infusions are a lot less likely to do this. So ferric carboxymaltose is the one to watch, but this is also one that we use commonly, right? And whilst this does appear to be fairly common, and MCQs love to ask you about this, the majority of patients who are affected by this have very mild to moderate changes in their phosphate with no symptoms and no consequences at all. But there are cases where people can have severe hypophosphatemia, including symptoms like muscle weakness and bone pain. And something else to know for those severe symptomatic cases is that the low phosphate can last for several weeks. And that's not intuitive, but this is due to the impact that FGF23 has on other hormones. So FGF23 also inhibits the activation of vitamin D. And we said at the start that activated vitamin D helps us to absorb phosphate and calcium. So now we're less able to absorb phosphate and calcium from our diet. And so now we're at risk of low calcium, which could stimulate your PTH. And the lack of activated vitamin D also means that there's less negative feedback on PTH. So now we have a lot more PTH around. And you can see where I'm going with this. Hold the four. We said at the start, PTH promotes phosphate loss from the kidney. So we got less phosphate coming in and more phosphate going out and it's a whole scene. So all of that to say that after this iron infusion effect wears off, even after FGF23 goes back to normal, there are all these other hormones in the mix contributing to this low phosphate situation. And one thing to say that I have seen come up in MCQs is that everything I have said applies to people with normal kidney function. This does not usually apply to my patients with CKD, especially advanced CKD, because at the best of times, they're not going to be letting go of phosphate very easily. So renal impairment is protective against this side effect of iron infusions. And whilst there are no clear evidence-based guidelines on how to best manage the low phosphate associated with iron infusions, a really great place to start is with giving calcitriol. That is activated vitamin D in a tablet form, and that will help us to absorb more phosphate and calcium and also suppress that PTH. Of course, you could combine that with phosphate supplements, but phosphate supplements on their own wouldn't be expected to do the trick here because we'll just keep passing them into our urine. But what happens the next time this person needs an iron infusion? Of course, it would be better if they didn't need an iron infusion. That would be most convenient to one's day. So addressing the cause of their iron deficiency in the first place is important here. But if someone did need ongoing iron infusions, you could switch them to a different iron infusion preparation that is far less likely to cause this problem. So that was the connection between iron infusions and low serum phosphate starring FGF23. I hope this helped your studies and your clinical practice and if you are studying for your exams be sure to check out our Reno for the Written playlist here on YouTube and make sure to stop by our website. There are so many goodies on there which make complex topics super simple and take the pain out of studying for your exams. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you again soon for some more higher learning. <laughs> Bye!